Welcome to this Mills and Reeves webinar on employment uh, tribunals. Um, well done for making it. Uh, 10 o'clock after an unexpected bank holiday isn't the easiest time, but it's um, great to have you have you with us. These are your presenters today, myself, Patrick Gass, uh, and Abisola. I think be between us, I was working out, we've got about 40 years plus of experience of dealing with um, employment uh, tribunal claims. We're all members of the Mills and Reeves Higher Education uh, team, so our day in day out work is advising universities and other education institutions. Uh, and a lot of our work, obviously, is dealing with employment tribunal claims and the matters that build up to them. So I hope you find this morning a really useful, uh, useful session. As I say, do please uh, scan the QR code, link in with us. It would be great to be able to do that. The session is um, being recorded, um, so the link to the recording and indeed the slides will be sent out to you. Uh, after the session. Next slide. Great. Um, one final housekeeping point. Do please, if you've got any questions as we go through, pop them into the uh, Q&A, not the chat, but the Q&A uh, feed, and we'll try and pick up some questions as we go through at the end of different sections and also at the end of the session time allowing. So what are we doing today? We're looking at employment uh, tribunals, how to manage employment tribunal claims, and in particular, how you can make a difference uh, in your world, whether that's in HR or indeed in legal, um, to managing claims effectively, and also the ways in which you can help your legal advisors, whoever they are, manage claims um, well. And I think at the forefront of our minds, really, we've got the concepts of needing to deal with things robustly, but proportionately, always having an eye on the strategic issues, so not losing uh, the wood for the trees, and obviously being cost effective. I think everyone recognises that the days of spending vast sums of money on employment tribunal claims doesn't make sense, and you have to deal with things proportionately and strategically. So we've got an hour. Uh, what are we going to be doing if we go over to the next slide? Uh, we're going to be looking at the different stages uh, of the ET process. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, and here is, um, here is the uh, slide of the process from beginning to end. Just in terms of a little bit of context, we had a, a moment ago a slide showing a sort of trend for uh, claims. Um, it's a little bit out of date, but it's fair to say that um, it's been an interesting time over the past year or two in the employment tribunal context. There's been a real pile up of claims in the ET uh, system. Uh, and it's not unusual now for employment tribunal claims often to take kind of two years, sometimes even longer uh, to be dealt with. There are some ways in which the system is being uh, addressed to deal with this. And there's been a bit of an uptick in employment tribunal judge recruitment uh, over the past few years. Um, other judges from different uh, areas are being assigned to employment tribunals. There have been new roles introduced, legal officer roles to try and help move claims along in the employment tribunal offices. We've had the introduction that Patrick will talk about later of the cloud video platform, which some of you may have had the joy of using, but quite a big change in terms of the practicalities, the power of claims are managed, hearings are conducted, the giving of evidence, um, those sorts of uh, issues. Uh, and listing uh, issues have changed as well. So the way tribunal claims are managed, very often uh, we now get direction up front, um, maybe before response is even lodged, uh, you're told what you have to do to prepare the claim, a sort of sense of front loading the claim. So there's been quite a few changes in, in the context of the landscape, and all of these factors, I think, are feeding into thinking about, well, how do we deal with claims in this landscape, given the change that we have for the strategic cost effective uh, in how we deal uh, with these claims. This is the various stages of the employment tribunal process, from cradle to grave, we could say, or complaint to remedy depending on how you want to look at it. And what we want to do today really is look at the practical aspects of the key elements of this, um, this process. And what we'll do is we'll pause and pick up one or two questions from the Q&A feed. So do put questions in there if you've got them, um, just to pick up on any points that arise from the sections that we are dealing with. We're not going to go through all of these um, different stages, um, but they give you a flavour of, of it from, as I say, the complaints arising to the remedy hearing um, and all the bits um, in between. There's one point I will pick up at the bottom there. Parties typically bear uh, their own costs. The question we often get, well, can't we go after people um, who are claimants um, to get costs off them? Uh, it is a difficult environment, the Employment Tribunal, for getting uh, cost awards. 
really a party does have to behave very unreasonably or vexatiously uh, in their conduct of the proceedings, and that is um, fairly unusual. And planning are generally reluctant um, to issue costs awards. So generally, the parties do bear their own costs uh, throughout those stages of the process. If you go on to the next uh, next slide, there are four types of hearing in the employment tribunal process, which much of today we're going to be looking at. These are kind of the pillars, I suppose, uh, of the tribunal um, process that the various things that we look at, disclosure, uh, hearing preparation, witness issues, uh, all come out of. Um, working from left to right on your screen, you've got the preliminary case management hearing, which usually happens at a fairly early stage. In the proceedings that happens in all but the most straightforward of cases really to identify the issues um you know what is it the tribunal has to decide <clears throat> when dealing with the claim the issue directions so things like a deadline for exchanging documents what's called um, disclosure preparing for the hearing exchanging witness statements all those sorts of things and the practicality of identifying hearing dates and considering judicial mediation issues you sometimes got a preliminary hearing to decide whether or not uh, an issue should be decided ahead of the main hearing where the evidence is is dealt with that would typically be around things like employment status is the person an employee if they need to be in the claim that they've brought is the person disabled uh, or not if they are bringing a disability claim and whether or not you deal with that um, at that stage or at a later stage will depend on a variety of factors that we'll look at the final hearing is the hearing at which the tribunal hears all of the evidence, it hears from the witnesses, can ask questions, and then determine do they think that the claim should succeed or not. And if it does, uh, then in theory, you move on to a remedy hearing to decide well how much money that uh, should uh, the claimant get, should other um, decisions be made in the claimant's favour, like should they be reinstated to their job or re-engaged in another job um, at the institution. But very often a matter will settle after a final hearing before you get to a remedy uh, hearing. Next slide. So uh, that's the kind of the context. Um, that's the overall process. Those are the pillars, um, the main hearings uh, of the process. With all that in mind, we're going to sort of take you through the key elements of the process, thinking about what are the issues you need to be thinking about? How can uh, you help your advisor prepare well? What are the things that you need to have? in mind when managing ET claims. So Vivi, over to you on drafting the response. Thanks, Alex. So we're starting right at the outset of the process. What happens when that um, ET1 and particulars of claim land on your doorstep? And as you may know, once the ET1 and particulars of claim are received by the institution, you'll have a period of 28 days to prepare the response. Often you'll have early knowledge that a claim may be about to land. It may be that you've been um, participating in ACAS early conciliation, or there's otherwise been a contentious process, but it really is when you get that claim, um, as I say, on the doorstep that the time period starts to run. And the um, ET3 response form and the grounds of resistance, which I'll refer to as the response, are really the bedrock of the institution's defence of the claim. But it's a really important document to get right. So with that in mind, what are the points that um, both you and your lawyers will be considering in drafting a response? The first point um, that many of you will be familiar with if you're used to dealing with employment tribunal litigation is that claim forms can come in various different shapes and sizes, depending on whether the claimant is represented or not and the complexity of the claim. And one of the points that it's really important to bot bottom out from the outset is whether that claim is in a sufficiently clear format to enable you to understand what the claim is and to enable you to respond to it. And if not, it may be that as part of the response to the claim, you're making clear that you're going to want and going to need further and better particulars of claim from the claimant. There is often a tactical point to be considered there in some circumstances, whilst the claim isn't as clear as you would want it to be, seeking further and better particulars can lead the claimant to potentially expand the claim. So as I say, thought will need to be given as to whether you've got enough information, even if not ideal, to enable you to be in a position to respond to it and make clear the institution's response to the allegations that are being made. The second point, uh, so middle top there, is ensuring that the response is both precise and thorough. 
um, and, and what do I mean by that? Now, often the scope of the response is determined in part by the length and detail contained within the particulars of claim, but there's also a balancing exercise to be undertaken there. So when I say that the response needs to be thorough, what I mean by that is that, as I say, it's the bedrock of the institution's response to the claim, and therefore you'll want to make sure that all key lines of defence are covered. You'll often see, and, and that's another point referred to on the slide, that sometimes people will say that they reserve their right to amend the response. Whereas in reality, if either a claimant or a respondent wants to amend either the claim or the response, they will need permission from the Employment Tribunal to do so. And the Employment Tribunal will only really give you that permission if it's satisfied that it would be prop proportionate and appropriate. And you're not likely to get permission to amend the response if, in actual fact, the matters that you're seeking to, to, to respond to are already contained within the particulars of claim. So it, it really is at the point that you're lodging the response that you need to make sure that all of the key lines of defence are covered off and that that document is, as I say, your, the bedrock of your response to the claim. I also say, though, that it's important for that document to be precise. And again, what do I mean by that? And often the temptation is for the response to be a line by line response to the claim that's been put in. But employment tribunals are quite clear that that's not what they want from a response. Yes, it needs to contain all of the institution's lines of defence, but it also needs to be a document which isn't seeking to be a narrative style of pleading or be something which is in lieu of witness statements, which will come later on. Alex also mentioned um, when talking about the various forms of hearing that you may have certain jurisdictional points that are considered at an early preliminary hearing. So is the claimant disabled, for example? Has the claim been brought um, in time? Does the claimant have sufficient service to bring the sort of claim that they're bringing? And those sorts of important jurisdictional points, whilst they won't be resolved at the stage of lodging the response, it's nevertheless important to put the institution's position forward in the response on those points, both so that it's clear at the outset what the institution's position is, but also from a tactical perspective, because it makes clear to the claimant any potential significant weaknesses that they're going to have in seeking to advance their claim. Similarly, the response is also an appropriate point to put any um, key issues around remedy. So even if the claimant is successful in their claim, is it argued that compensation should be limited any, in any way? For example, if it's a redundancy dismissal, if the claimant failed to accept an alternative role, then it would be imp important and relevant to mention that in the response in the, from the perspective of uh, limiting remedy. And then the final point to mention about uh, the kind of practical point for the response is that it is a document that needs to be kept under review. It can all can be all too easy to think that you draft the response, you kind of put it in the bundle of documents and then you don't look at it again until the final hearing. Whereas in reality, it is a document that needs to be kept under review. Again, as those of you who are familiar with tribunal litigation will know, there are sometimes circumstances that arise that mean that it would be appropriate to apply for permission to amend the response. So if the claimant seeks to add to their claim, for example, it's important to revisit the response to make sure that it remains um, a comprehensive overview of the um, institution's response to the claim. Again, it's important to take a proportionate approach to that. In some circumstances, it may be that providing that um, the institution is clear that it denies all of the claims, you wouldn't necessarily want to keep amending it at each um, available opportunity. So how can HR and in-house legal teams help their lawyers in preparing the response? The first point is a fairly obvious one, but, but one that I'll make in any event, which is that it's important to send um, us the claim form as soon as you receive it. 28 days can sound like quite a long time, but in reality, that time can go very quickly. Within that 28 day period, you'll receive the claim. You'll need to send it to your lawyers for them to consider what documents and information they need. That will enable you to go and gather that documentation and information to send it over to your lawyers. It will enable an initial draft to be um, prepared and then for some back and forth to fine tune it. So bearing in mind what I said about it being an important document that really um, sets off the uh, claim from the respondent's perspective, the more time that you allow for that document to be prepared, the better a position it will be in and ultimately the more that it can help the defence of the claim. The final two points on the slide relate to the provision of documents and information, which, as I say, will be needed to prepare the response. So if you're able to provide that documentation um, as quickly as possible and also um, in a, a well-ordered fashion, so chronologically grouped by stage of process, um, that in turn will enable your lawyers to prepare the response in a time and cost efficient way. 
Um, and then similarly, there may be information that you need to provide which isn't contained within document documentation. So you may need to consult with people who are involved in the process. Again, if you're able to get them on hand as soon as you're aware of the claim, taking into account any periods of leave, that will again make sure that you've got a smooth process for getting that information over and getting a, a draft response as soon as possible. Patrick, any questions in the chat on that section? I didn't see any come in. No, 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 no come in. So you've obviously covered it comprehensively. Good. Well, we can pick up any questions at the end if needed. Um, but for now, we'll move on to management hearings. Great, thanks. Yes, if you do have any questions, please do pop them in the Q&A feed and we will try and pick them up at the end of each section and indeed at the end of the session. So do, do make use of that. Uh, so stage two, uh, case management hearings, to expand really on some of the points that I made um, towards the beginning of, of the session. Um, the response goes in, often things go quiet for a bit, uh, and the next thing um, that you have is a case management hearing in the diary, which happen in all but the most straightforward uh, of cases uh, these days. This is to clarify the issues to be determined um, by the tribunal and to give those orders for preparation of the case for a hearing. So disclosure of documents, exchange of witness statements, at hearing dates, uh, and also for consideration, uh, at least initially, in some cases as to whether or not the parties are interested in judicial uh, mediation. I think so these hearings do vary in importance depending on the type of claim. And um, sometimes I think they're really critical to get things on the right track underway well. In, in other much more straightforward cases, it's a little bit of a box ticking exercise and relatively pro forma um, in, in approach. To go on to the next, next slide, uh, what are some of the tips and things that you need to be thinking about uh, when preparing for um, case management preliminary uh, hearings? I think a really good point, working from the left to the right, on that slide is, is to make sure you get on the front foot if you can uh, early in the case. As Bibi was saying, sometimes the issues uh, in a claim are not particularly uh, clear and the case management hearing is a key time for them to be to be clarified and judges are not necessarily uh, as effective at doing that as you would always want. So doing things like a draft list of issues, uh, trying to be quite strategic in terms of analysing what's in the claim form, uh, what the issues are, <coughs> what claims are brought, are really important things to do. And I think making sure that everything is nailed down at that early stage. So following a preliminary hearing, case management preliminary hearing, the tribunal will typically issue um, orders and uh, confirming directions for the preparation for the hearing and also summarising the issues and identifying the issues to be determined by the tribunal. You want to ensure that is in good shape. If it's not, then you can end up <coughs> with all sorts of further problems uh, down the line. Uh, I had one case, give you one example, a very large case a few years ago, multiple witnesses, we've had problems at uh, getting the issues clarified as we would have wanted to along the way, uh, all sorts of reasons for that. But we got to the final hearing and a lot of the issues were then unpicked and we put back together uh, by the judge, which was a bit of a nightmare at the beginning of the hearing, a lesson in trying to make sure they are clear and nailed down um, from the outset. Very often it is the claimant that's under pressure at that hearing. The claimant sometimes put on the spot, well, what are you claiming, claimant? The judge will say he will go through and try and uh, clarify it, he or she, the judge. Uh, but very often it can be useful to sort of be helpful um, in that process, try and sort of help the judge and the claimant understand what the claimant is pursuing. That is often in the interest of all parties to make sure everything is clear. Is a preliminary hearing required? Second block in the middle there. Um, on a particular issue. Uh, often that is a tactical <coughs> question. So a typical one would be um, disability. If a claim is brought for disability, are you going to concede <coughs> disability straight away? Are you going to contest disability? There might be tactical reasons uh, for doing that because you consider uh, that does apply some pressure to the claimant in a context where the evidence on disability is not very clear or it may be that it seems pretty obvious the claimant is disabled, there's no point in carrying time and costs, or indeed aggravating the tribunal, they don't tend to like it, if you can test disability in circumstances where it really is quite obvious the person is very likely to be disabled. Um, there are those sorts of issues that come into play. Um, time limits, it is often a, an issue that comes up. Very often you get discrimination claims with claims stretching over a long period of time, 
And there might be a bit of a debate around what well, should the tribunal to decide, well, are there claims which are out of time um, that shouldn't be heard? Or do they all have to be considered at a final hearing? Because in order to decide whether or not claims are in time as part of a continuing act of discrimination, you have to hear all of the evidence. I think in general, um, unfortunately, um, from a respondent's perspective, usually a tribunal will take the view they can't make a decision on a continuing act of discrimination at an early stage. And they will normally want to hear all of the evidence before making a decision on that, which means that most of if not all of the allegations that are raised will have to be dealt with at a final hearing. But again, something to think very carefully about. In some cases, there are stronger arguments to be deployed than others around what well, clearly certain acts are obviously not part of the continuing act. And to make sure you go hard at that, try and get the tribunal to make a decision on that in your favour, because if they do, that reduces significantly the preparation for final hearing, the number of witnesses, the cost associated with the hearing, and indeed potentially the risks associated with the claim. Always important to consider the final hearing, the length and the date at an early stage. So with legal advice, how long will the hearing um, take? Getting dates of witnesses ahead of time. Always sensible, I think, to err on the long side, a day too many rather than a day too few uh, when uh, considering the length of a hearing, because if you go part heard, you don't finish all of the evidence that makes it much more difficult to pick up the hearing at a later date for a short period of time and generally delay is not really in anyone's favour. And I've already mentioned the drafting the list of issues, orders and agenda. I think those are important documents for the reasons I said earlier. At the same time, we've probably all dealt with situations where you're dealing with difficult claimants, perhaps claimants in person, who understandably won't always understand the issues and it's very difficult to get the documents agreed. If that's the case, I think being proportionate uh, is, is, a, is a key factor to have in mind. There's no point in going at it a, you know, again and again, trying to get something to agree where you're never going to get there. Better, I think, to do what you can. You submit as a respondent institution your list of issues, your agenda, noting to the tribunal that it's not agreed. The tribunal will normally recognise the reasons for that, and that will be a helpful document for them when they're addressing those issues at the case management hearing. To go on to the next slide in terms of how can HR or indeed I think legal teams internally uh, help help their lawyers. I think clear instructions on key issues <laughs> is very important. How do you want to deal with disability issues? Are you interested in judicial mediation? That might be more relevant with somebody who remains in employment. You wish to preserve the relationship. Exploring that and indicating to the tribunal at an early stage and indeed to the claimant that you are interested in pursuing that, that will be important. Witness dates, very key to make sure you get identified the witnesses that the university will need uh, to be able to defend the claim. Are there any dates that need to be avoided which they cannot uh, attend, usually for a very sort of pre-booked reason that can't be changed, perhaps a pre-booked foreign holiday rather than dates that are simply inconvenient um, for business reasons, and make sure the witnesses block out their diaries so they keep those dates clear because they will likely get nailed down, listed as hearing dates um, by the tribunal at the case management hearing. I sometimes think that lawyers are brought in a bit late into liaising with witnesses. There's often, I think, value in putting lawyers in touch with witnesses at an early stage, giving them a bit, bit of a flavour about what the tribunal process involves <clears throat> so they recognise and understand they're going to get the support that they need in defending the university at tribunal, giving evidence to the tribunal. Is it essential for HR or indeed other people from the university to attend case management hearing? No, it's not essential, but I think it, sometimes it can be helpful. Questions can arise on judicial mediation. Sometimes it seems to pop up where it's useful to take instructions. So not essential. Very often um, that doesn't happen. And if somebody is free, available to attend, if somebody in HR hasn't got experience and would find it interesting, it can be a useful exercise for somebody to attend. Phoebe, I don't know whether there are any questions in the Q&A feed that we can pick up. Yes, there are a couple, and the first of which um, I think you've just answered, Alex. So the first was who should attend uh, a case management hearing. So as Alex said, it can often be helpful to have someone from HR in attendance. I think um, the other factor that sometimes arises is that there can be um, a desire to send lots of people to a case management hearing. 
And whilst the um, institution is a party to the proceedings, I think it's also important to remember that it is a private hearing. So typically the tribunal won't want lots and lots of people in attendance um, at the case management hearing, uh, unless that's proportionate and appropriate. Um, and then the second question there is how often a case is dismissed at the SIF stage? Should we assume that it's rare and not get our hopes upon that one? And unfortunately, I think I would agree with you on that. I don't know about Alex or Patrick, but certainly in my experience, I've not had any cases dismissed at the SIF stage, even when it's clear that it's out of time or the claimant doesn't have sufficient service. So those points can often be picked up fairly quickly, um, but unfortunately, it won't negate your need to prepare a response and attend a case management preliminary hearing, unfortunately. Great, so moving on to the next section, I think it's Patrick that's going to take us through disclosure. Thank you, Abisela. Yes, the disclosure, this is often the most time consuming part of tribunal litigation for, for both those in HR and in-house legal and also for, for us lawyers acting for you. And it's also often the most frustrating and time consuming for witnesses as well. They've got to look and provide to the claimant documents that are relevant to the issues in the case, and, and just pausing there and picking up a point that Alex made here, one of the reasons you want the issues focused early at the stage and as clear as you can is, is for this obligation of disclosure. If you don't know what those legal and factual issues are, you can't properly look for documents that are relevant to those issues. So, so what is the duty of disclosure? If we just go to the next slide. Well, it's a standard tribunal direction that all documents that are relevant to the issues in the claim that are in a party's possession, custody or control should be disclosed to the other party. Now, this does include documents on which you intend to rely, as well as documents which adversely affect your case, which is an important point to bear in mind. The, the, the important point is, are they relevant documents, not do they assist you? The question is, do they assist the tribunal in determining the issues? I'm just picking up some of the points on, on, on this slide here. The duty of disclosure, it's a continuing duty. Parties have a duty to disclose any further documents which come to light after your main disclosure exercise has taken place. So it's not a once and it's not a once undertaken, that's the process done. You have to continue to just look to see whether there's any relevant documents and disclose them, including up to the up to including the final hearing. In terms of the, the extent of the search, you're required to undertake a reasonable but not an exhaustive search for documents that should be disclosed. Um, take the point that it can be difficult to decide what is what is reasonable, but it's continuing this line of proportionality. Uh, in terms of what the documents entails, it's anything in which information of any description is recorded. So this includes computer records, it includes emails, databases, audio communications, text messages, instant messages and posts on forums such as Twitter and Facebook. The key point is are they relevant, not where documents are located. Um, the de de definition of a document also extends to material that is not readily accessible. So you might need to look at deleted emails, see if anything's been backed up on servers and backup systems. Just because an email is deleted doesn't mean that you might not be able to, to recover it and, and find it. Also, confidentiality and commercial sensitivity does not override the duty to disclose documents. The key test, again, is whether the document is relevant. And, and just a final point on this, obligation of disclosure is taken extremely seriously by the tribunals. And if they think that a party has not complied, complied, they can impose cost penalties and even criminal sanctions. So it's something to take seriously. Um, on to the next slide, please. So just some thoughts on disclosure from, from me. I'll share, I'll start by sharing a recent experience of mine on the dangers of missing documents. I was in a final employment tribunal hearing by video just before Christmas. And one of our witnesses was, was on the stand giving evidence and was being questioned by the opposition's, the opponent's barrister. They've taken to an email in the bundle, which is from the claimant to, to the witness. And they were asked simply whether they had replied to that email. And the answer from the witness came back, yes. Yes, I did reply to that email. But the reply email was not in the bundle of documents. Now, it didn't look like it was a crucial email, a, cu a crucial reply, but the judge followed up the question from the, for the, for the opponent's barrister by asking the witness why the email is not in the bundle. Asked the witness, did you not look for relevant documents? And in a moment of panic, the witness said, no, no, I didn't. I didn't look for any documentation. Now, this wasn't the case. 
she had looked for the relevant she had looked for the relevant documents the process of disclosure had been explained to them but it just a long it was a long time previously but she was under oath at the at the employment tribunal and he concluded from that that the respondent must not have complied with its disclosure obligations and it asked the respondent to redo the disclosure exercise overnight and now it, it still sends shivers down my spine thinking about 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 doing that over, overnight unfortunately on repeating the exercise the respondent found a, a, a whole load of other relevant documents that hadn't been disclosed previously so this was another error in that disclosure exercise the respondent was massively on the back foot from that moment on and, and decided to settle the case rather than continue with the proceedings given given the issues that have been occurring in disclosure so just just give it, it just give some thought to how seriously the, the disclosure obligation is, is is taken and some other thoughts from from me often claimants will argue that a respondent must be hiding documents they often have a belief that managers must have been corresponding negatively about them all all of the time um, and often therefore we can receive often very unfocused requests for additional documents but you can't just ignore that request you need to have, you need to consider it consider if there are any documents that you haven't looked for yet that may be that maybe need to be disclosed if you don't do that voluntarily a claimant can ask the tribunal can make an application for an order for specific disclosure that doesn't mean that you just have to to spend hours and hours searching for documents again focus on the list of issues in the case is the request for documents, is it relevant to the issues? Are the documents likely to assist the tribunal? If not, then you can, you can refuse to provide those documents, even refuse to carry out the search. Um, as well as documents relevant to liability, you should also disclose documents relevant to mitigation, relevant to remedy. Now, this is mostly documents that, that show other vacancies out there that a claimant perhaps could could do and it's often overlooked i think in in tribunal processes perhaps looked at too late if you can at an early stage be looking at the claim looking at the claimant cv looking at their previous job and thinking are there any job, jobs in the market out there that are relevant for them can we be looking at times higher can we be looking at guardian jobs see if there's other vacancies they could be and should be applying for if we can get on top of that process early on that will help much later much later on in the process if we do get to the question of remedy now on to the next slide please so how can hr and others help us as your lawyers well tips from the slide consider the potential source of documents that's that is important don't just provide for example typed up notes of meetings are there any handwritten notes of those meetings often individuals think they don't need to disclose handwritten notes just the typed up minutes but not only is that incorrect, the obligation of disclosure will cover those handwritten notes. Often, though, they are also the most important documents, they're the most persuasive because they were taken at the time that the evidence was happening. They're contemporaneous to that. Yes, look at emails and don't forget to look for deleted emails and backups and on the service. What about text messages? What about WhatsApp messages? Are there other sources that you haven't, you wouldn't automatically consider? Also, Draft documents, are there earlier drafts of outcomes to grievances, et cetera? If so, they could be relevant as well. Also important to make sure that everyone in the organization is aware of the obligations of, of, of disclosure. We don't want helpful documents accidentally being, being deleted. Also, if documents are deliberately deleted and, and unhelpful documents are lost, the consequences for that can be very Severe. So do make sure from the outset that everybody knows, witnesses, HR managers, etc., knows to preserve documents that are relevant to the issues. And as a reminder, the, the duty of disclosure is an ongoing duty. It lasts throughout the proceedings, including at the final hearing. So if a document does come to light later, don't sit on it, forward it on to us as soon as possible so we can consider whether it is a disclosable document and should be disclosed to the other side. On that, there is nothing worse than a document turning up during a hearing when a witness of ours who could have talked to the document, could have addressed it, has already finished their evidence. And also a judge could draw an adverse inference to say, why, why are you disclosing this late? It, that might undermine our credibility and the judge could take against us because of that. And one final point on this, just be careful also of creating new documents. For example, emails discussing the cases, the case that could be disclosable even if litigation has started. Although all documents, all emails to us, they should be protected by, by privilege. I've seen some questions coming in, Alex, on the chat as we were, as I was going through. 
Yes, I think what we'll do, Patrick, is we'll just pick those up at the end. We should have hopefully five minutes at the end, but we'll just, um, I think, carry on to the next next section for now, just to make sure that we get to the core content and then pick up those questions at the end. So, Bibi, over to you. The process is usually, is usually the taking of uh, witness evidence. And you might recall that I mentioned towards the beginning that the response isn't intended to be a narrative style document and isn't supposed to replace the role of witness statements. So this is the stage at which the institution will have the ability to put the meat on the bones of its response to the claim by way of um, illustrating the role of different individuals and how um, they say um, the, that the claim shouldn't be successful. So there'll need to be quite early thought given to the planning of witness evidence. And whilst, as I say, the uh, exchange of witness statements happens after disclosure, in reality, you're likely to have considered um, who are likely to be witnesses for the organisation at a much earlier stage than this, probably around the stage of drafting the response and the uh, case management preliminary hearing. And typically the, the approach that we would take to planning who the witnesses are going to be is to ultimately have the, the list of issues or likely list of issues, look at all of the key issues in the case and consider who from the institution would be in the best position to respond to and talk to that particular point. And that will enable us to have, uh, have a view to any particular issues that are going to arise with that witness evidence. So have any of those individuals left the organization's employment? Again, early planning is, is going to be your best friend in those circumstances. Quite often, even before a claim lands, it's known that a particular um, dismissal or a particular grievance outcome is going to be contentious. And you may therefore be able to have early conversations with individuals who have left or who are soon to leave uh, to secure their agreement to participate as part of any future employment tribunal um, litigation. So thought will need to be given to whether, to whether any um, recently departed employees are content to participate in the proceedings and assist the organisation in its defence. There may be individuals who are still employed um, by the organisation, but who nevertheless, it's considered, may not be particularly helpful as witnesses, either because they're reluctant witnesses or because they will lack credibility. In those circumstances, we may then move on to a secondary list of people who may be better placed to provide witness evidence. So, for example, if the chair um, of a particular hearing isn't thought to be the best witness, can someone else on that panel provide witness evidence in their place? You'll also likely be aware that there are ways in which um, the organisation can force an in individual to attend as a witness by securing a witness order. But from a tactical perspective, that's not very often going to be the best approach to take. Um, a hostile witness usually isn't the best witness for the organisation. And in those circumstances, you also don't necessarily have the ability to serve a witness statement for them. So that would need to be thought of very carefully indeed. Once you've got your list of witnesses and it's you've kind of worked through any issues in terms of difficulties with that witness evidence, do you have any gaps in the evidence, um, whether because you're not able to secure a witness or otherwise? If so, are there any ways in which you can cover off that uh, witness evidence in other ways? Is there documentary evidence, for example, that, that can helpfully cover the point? If not, it's likely to be a sensible stage at which to consider how that might affect the institution's ability to successfully defend the claim and thereby uh, enable you to have any strategic discussions needed around what that means in terms of the defence of the claim and what steps you might want to take, for example, whether settlement might be something that, that, that might be more attractive in, in those circumstances. And then the, the final point that we put on the right there is a question as to whether the number of witnesses impacts the arrangements for the hearing. If you've got a three day listing, for example, and you're planning to call 10 witnesses, then you're not going to get through all of that evidence in the time listed for the hearing. So it might be necessary at that stage to apply to the employment tribunal to extend the length of the hearing. They won't be particularly happy if you turn up on day one and you've got that number of witnesses and haven't given it prior thought. As I said, in, in all reality, you're likely to have explored that at the stage of the case management preliminary hearing, and that will have impacted on and fed into the length of the hearing. But there are sometimes circumstances, and I can think of a few that I'm dealing with at the moment, where it's only at the stage of taking witness evidence that you realise there are additional people that you need to call. So it's something that you'll need to keep um, an eye on as, as the proceedings progress. So we've put here some of our top tips for good witness statements. Um, so I'm going to cover ju just a few of those um, in terms of points that we would be bearing in mind when taking witness evidence. 
I think it's always really important to bear in mind that the purpose of a witness statement is to speak to particular points um, in the response to the claim. And ultimately, it's a document that needs to be easily understood by the employment judge. In terms of making sure that it's clear how that statement is relevant to the issues and making sure that that statement is uh, clear, logical and follows a chronological documents um, to make sure that it's easily understood by the employment tribunal. And then in terms of the content of that statement, it, it is particularly important and something that judges are particularly keen on that the witness statement deals with information which is in that witness's own personal knowledge. So if we're talking about a witness statement, uh, which is for the person that made a decision to dismiss, that statement is primarily going to deal with the process that that individual um, undertook in terms of the hearing arrangements, the evidence they considered, and what factors they took into account in making that decision. The, the employment tribunal isn't particularly swayed by and will put little weight on um, hearsay evidence that that person might have, personal opinions and speculation. Ultimately, that statement needs to be a relevant account of that person's involvement in that process and the specific factors and um, information that they took into account in coming to that decision. And I also think it can't be underestimated the importance of making sure that that statement is in the witness's own words. And I mean that in, in two respects. Now, now, the witness is giving that evidence under oath in the employment tribunal. And it's therefore important that that is um, true and accurate information. So whilst there can be a temptation, particularly if um, you as members of HR or in-house legal are reviewing um, that witness statement to have it say particular things, the Employment Tribunal won't uh, find that witness credible if the statement doesn't contain information which is a true reflection of their account of events. So it's important that even if it does have a particular view which isn't necessarily helpful to the institution's position, the opposite isn't um, done such that the statement isn't said to be an accurate account of their events. And then the second point is that I think it's also helpful for that witness statement to be phrased in a way which is um, reflective of that witness's particular way of speaking. We wouldn't typically put information in a witness statement which isn't within that witness's own vocabulary because again that can make that witness statement more liable to come and done under cross-examination if that statement doesn't feel reflective of how the witness themselves would phrase things. So how can um, HR and the in-house legal teams help their lawyers to prepare witness evidence? I think um, the first point really comes into a lot of what I was saying at the beginning, which is that early planning will be important in terms of considering who the witnesses are going to be. And that will enable you to make practical arrangements for securing the participation of those witnesses. I've talked about um, discussing early on, for example, with those who are likely to leave the institution. Um, or, or who have left the institution by the time that the hearing comes around. And similarly, as Alex was talking about earlier on, I think it's also important to ensure that witnesses are brought into the fold um, earlier on into the proceedings. We come across lots of different witnesses um, in the course of preparing defences to claims. There are some who are more familiar with the process and therefore are more comfortable with the proceedings, but perhaps more often than not, it's something which is um, unsurprisingly not familiar to them and something that they may have concerns about. So ensuring that there are open lines of communication between those witnesses and both the lawyers and a designated contact in HR can make it a much witness evidence in making sure that they feel as comfortable as they can do in the circumstances. Um, and then there are other ways in which, you know, other than providing open lines of communication, you can have um, good means of support for witnesses. One, um, one way in which we do that is by providing witness, witness familiarization training, which is a process wh whereby all of the witnesses will have a session with a lawyer who's not running the case, but who can talk to them about how best to give witness evidence, what to expect from the employment tribunal process, and ultimately make sure that they're as comfortable as possible ahead of the hearing, which can, as I say, really help the quality of the university or institution's witness evidence. Patrick, I haven't seen if there are any questions that come in on that section. Just a couple of quick ones, conscious of time. One, one is, can witnesses be anonymous? I and mean, the short answer to that is, is, is no, they can't. There are certain circumstances where you can apply for what's called a restricted reporting order so evidence that they give doesn't get into the public domain but, but they're quite exceptional and and the, and the tribunal expects that um, witnesses will will sign their statements and be prepared to to attend the hearing to to be asked asked questions on it and another important question was 
if the main witnesses have left the organizations, can they be called? Uh, the answer is yes, yes, they can, but you can sometimes struggle to convince them vol to voluntarily attend. But if they're a key witness, then you're going to want to make, take steps to to make sure that they that they will they will attend. If they refuse, you can apply for a witness order to compel their attendance, but that isn't often a good idea because they're they're, they're not going to necessarily be supportive of you if you've if you've done that. Uh, so on to the final stage, tribunal hearings. Next slide, please. Please, BB. This is where all the previous hard work is put to the test. So next slide, please. Tribunal hearings, where and where and how. So pre-pandemic, all hearings were in person, even very short case management ones. So often you could see hours of travel for a, perhaps a 20 minute hearing. Then in the pandemic, the tribunal hearings were centers were all closed and everything went remote. We're now back to somewhere in the middle. The tribunal is trying to get all most final hearings to be in person, but often preliminary hearings are still being conducted remotely by default, as are judicial mediations. They're all being done remotely at the moment, and I think this is probably likely to be a permanent change. There are advantages and disadvantages to, to this. Essentially, the more complex the issues, the more likely the tribunal will want the hearing in person. You can ask for a hybrid hearing, so some people attending in person, others attending via video um, but it can be a little bit difficult to to follow so if you are going to apply that make sure you've thought through the the consequences before you do so on to the next slide please bb so the tribunal where it happens tribunal hearing centers are not glamorous there is no there's no oak paneling normally they're pretty cheap office rooms with with stains on the carpet and the air conditioning is typically too noisy. I, I think my favourite tribunal centre is, is Croydon, which is located over a, a gym. So often you have to compete with a very noisy spin class downstairs when, when, when your witnesses are giving, giving evidence. That said, there, are, there is formality. The, the tribunal panel, which is typically a, a judge and two lay members, sit at the front on a slightly raised platform. Um, but in terms of formality, there is there are no there are no wigs for the for the solicitors and the and the barristers or indeed the, the tri tribunal panel. Um, behind in front of the in front of the panel, you have a desk for the witness. The witness will will sit there and and will give evidence there. They're not allowed to take any notes with them to the to the witness desk. There'll be a clean version of their statement and a clean bundle of documents there for them when they're giving their evidence. You'll you'll see at the back of the room. There is often seating available for those not giving evidence at the time, and, and members of the public can also attend and sit there and listen in to the to the hearing. On to the next slide, please. So the format of the hearing, it is it is reasonably informal, but it is still an adversarial process. So it is one side against the other, and, and that is not to be lost. But in terms of formality, as I say, there was no there were no gowns, there were no there were no wigs, there was no shouts of order or objection or or indeed there is no gravel slamming on the on the on the table from from the judge calling people to to order it try and make it as informal and as relaxed as possible so people feel comfortable in the environment the panel is made up of an employment judge who will be a solicitor or a barrister of of many years experience and and then wing members or, or lay members as they're often called. One one will have background from an employer side, and one will have the background perhaps from a trade union employer side. They are the industrial tribunal, and it's their decision, their joint decision together, in terms of deciding cases. Um, each side takes takes their turn in presenting their evidence and being questioned on it. And once all the witnesses have given their evidence. The, the lawyers will have a chance to provide any closing submissions, summing up the factual basis of their claim and making any legal points that they want to make before the tribunal panel normally would reserve uh, to decide and make their decision. Just conscious of time, so whistling through to the next slide, please. Burden of proof, I think this is important. It's something that's often overlooked. And, and I was thinking about about the burden of proof when watching Ozark on Netflix the other day. I don't know if anyone who's watching this has seen Ozark. If not, you should. It's, it's a very, it's a great show. I can't find anything to replace it on Netflix at the moment. But the, um, the main catch in this is running a casino on a boat to launder money for a Mexican drug cartel. But despite this, he's a good guy. He's a, he's a family man. He's the hero of, of the piece. 
The FBI know that what he's, what he's doing, and they know that he's breaking the law. In fact, everybody knows this. Yet he is not prosecuted in the criminal courts in the US for that. Why not? Well, it's because the criminal standard of proof is beyond all reasonable doubt. And that's quite a high hurdle. You need a lot of very persuasive evidence before you commit to criminal proceedings. And, and you also see this in, in real life. Someone like OJ Simpson can be acquitted at a criminal trial, but found liable for compensation on the same charges in a civil claim. This because civil claims, and that includes the employment tribunal process in the UK, consider decisions on the balance of probabilities. That gives the, that gives the tribunal a lot more discretion to make a finding against a, a party. Of course, there still needs to be evidence, but it does give the tribunal a wider discretion to decide where they think the justice of this situation lies. It also makes it quite difficult to appeal any wrong decisions. Um, on to the next slide, please. Just a quick checklist and, and preparation I find is, is, is always key here. And it can be slightly different based on whether the hearing is in person or, in rem or remote. In respect of remote hearings, the same issues that face us daily on Zoom or Teams apply on video hearings in the, the employment tribunal. Is your IT up to it? Have you got two screens to help you navigate the system? So I always recommend if you're tending to give evidence uh, remotely by, by video that if you can, you have two screens, one with the hearing on and the second screen has the bundle of documents, has your witness statement on it as well. And make sure you've tested that in advance. Um, also, just, just rem remember remote online etiquette definitely does apply in the video. Last year, I was in a hearing where there were 20 parties dialed in remotely. I had my microphone and my camera muted. I took a call from, from a witness who was struggling to join, join the hearing remotely. I talked her through how to, how to join, the, join, join the hearing. And I said, to her, look, before you do, before you do join, make sure that your camera, is, camera is, is off and make sure that your microphone is muted. She assured me that it was, but when she joined the hearing, unfortunately, neither of the things were true. And she continued trying to have a conversation with me, that all 20 parties, the judge, the lay members, everybody could hear. Thankfully, she didn't say anything prejudicial, but the judge had to keep repeatedly asking her to mute herself and to, to turn, turn her camera off. So just if you've, if you've got all that set up in advance and you've tested everything out, you'll have the comfort that that sort of, that sort of issue isn't going to happen. In terms of dress, you need to be, you need to be comfortable with, with what you're wearing. There are no strict requirements for your, your, your dress code, but I would suggest that you will you will you wear remotely what you would wear if you're attending the hearing in, in person. It is, it is a formal professional process, so make sure that you, you do look do look the part. Um, on to the next slide, please. So how can HR and in-house help their, their lawyers? Well, as I said, it's important to ask witnesses to actually test the, the video link that will be sent in advance to make sure that it works. Really helpful to have the two screens, as I've already said. And, and also, as I said, you, you will not be able to take a witness statement that you've scribbled on with notes on when you're actually giving giving an evidence, you will have to have a clean copy and you will be asked to, to confirm that it is a, a clean copy. The same applies to the hearing bundle, the bundle of all the documents as well. In advance, if the hearing is remote, we will have set up a private WhatsApp group that witnesses and HR are invited to join so that during the course of the hearing, you can pass any comments to the lawyers that you, you want to make to us so that we can pass those on to the, onto the barrister. If the hearing is happening in person, will bring where there's lots of post-it notes that will serve the same function. So you can scribble notes, pass them up to, to the legal team. If the hearing is in person, we'll normally meet in advance at the hearing centre so we can discuss the, the format of the day. We can answer any questions. So we'll try and do that in advance if the hearing is, is remote as well. We'll set up a Teams, a Teams call that's running throughout the day so that we can just jump on and answer any questions when there are breaks in the hearing. But it is important when giving evidence by a video, treat it as a formal hearing. As I said, not allowed to have documents with you. Don't have coffee cups appearing in the in on the screen as well. Just a clear glass of water to take a to take, to take a drink. In terms of support, we we ensure that witnesses can feel as supported as, as possible. And something that we offer and we recommend that that people take up on is we often routinely offer training for witnesses, witness familiarisation training. So they can have a go at what it's like to be asked questions in the in the tribunal hearing before they actually come to the day to do that 
in person and we'll provide also a witness briefing trying to demystify some of the the issues that often come up at the employment tribunal so i think that leaves us with with, with five with five minutes for questions on on the topics that we've covered today great thanks thanks patrick and um, bb i don't know whether there are any um questions that um, came out of the content patrick was talking about there uh, so there was one question uh, as to whether there's a list of where employment tribunals are in the timetable that uh, people can attend as a member of the public to see what happens live. And yes, I mean, as um, has been mentioned during this, this session, um, apart from if there are special um, arrangements in place, which is fairly rare, all hearings are public hearings, all final hearings are public hearings, so members of the public can attend. And typically, if you attend the employment tribunal in the morning, you'll see a list of the cases that are happening on that day. And as I say, anyone can attend any hearing. In fact, it can be something which can be helpful for witnesses to do um, if they have time to do so to get them familiar with, with the process. As a question, should chat messages on Teams be disclosed? The answer to that is, is yes, if they're relevant. Um, to the issues, um, then in the same way as any other uh, document, if they're in your possession or um, control, they should be disclosed. Patrick, there's quite an interesting question on judicial mediation and and how practically sort of that can be um, conducted, in particular, who should attend. I wonder, given some of your recent experience, if you had any comments on that. Yes, um, so I've, I've attended a lot of um, judicial mediations, including, including many recently by video and um, the tribunal will require you to have a decision maker from both parties at the judicial mediation so that's someone who's got the authority to enter into a, a financial and practical settlement um it, 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 often that could be hr director but it doesn't it doesn't need to be and if they need to be able to ring someone back at back at the ranch to if, if they need to up the offer for example then that, that needs to be arranged in advance as as well um but other than other than that um you don't need any of the witnesses in respect of the factual and legal issues on the claim the idea is not to not to get bogged down in the legal the factual detail of the claim it's, it's it's to try and actually broker a broker a deal great there's a question uh around um destroying handwritten notes once formal notes are agreed um should they be retained the hand handwritten notes I mean, certainly, if if sort of litigation sort of in the offing, then you shouldn't really be just well, you shouldn't be destroying uh, any documents at that point. Um, that is a problem in terms of your duty, um, yeah, in terms of the, the uh, disclosure rules that would apply. Um, if sort of the matter of course, you know, you you just destroy notes because that's what you do. There's no particular um, concern or indication of, of of litigation. Then. Um, it is what it is, but as Patrick was saying, I think very often actually handwritten notes are are very useful and have a lot more value than than type notes. Um, so as a general principle, I think retaining those at least for the period during which um, claims can be can be lodged, um, the time limit period is is generally a sensible thing to be doing. I would say. Maybe were there any other questions that you picked out that you thought we could cover? No, let me just see. Um, There's just one I was going to pick up on how far do you indulge a claimant to insist on further disclosure up to almost the day of the hearing and therefore does not agree to the final hearing bundle. I mean, this is this is quite common that you can't get a claimant to agree to the final hearing bundle. It, it used to be tribunals are quite prescriptive about that and would try and get you to agree it, but I think they've recognised that that's often impossible. And they often say if if you can't, if, if you can't encourage a claimant that the document isn't relevant, just stick it in, just stick it into the back of the bundle. But but if you're you're so close to the final hearing that the bundle's been prepared, it's been paginated, you've got copies done, then I think if it's too late, you can just say to the claimant, look, I'm sorry, the bundle is prepared. If you want to include further material, you need to you need to provide copies to the to the tribunal separately. And that can be picked up on the first morning of the of the final hearing. And, and, and that's often what is done, the tribunal reserved the first morning just to try and bottom out any final case management issues that haven't been that haven't been resolved. But I mean, I, I always have one go at telling a claimant, look, I don't think this document is relevant or your request isn't relevant, but often they don't often they don't listen. And there's no point banging the same the same drum. Um, just stick just stick the documents in the bundle if you if you can. 
Thanks, Patrick. Well, that just leads us to say, if we go to the next slide, do please, if you'd like to scan up to our QR code for our latest invites, updates um, for the HE sector. And if we go across to our next slide, we've actually got coming up um, a really interesting uh, series starting on the 27th of September, looking at international issues uh, in the HE uh, sector. The first of these kicks off on the 27th of September, uh, looking at, I think, the country of India. We'll be covering the US, Middle East, Southeast Asia, and other countries over that series. So do scan that if you'd like to get further details of that international series. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining us. It's been great to have you with us. Um, hope you have a good rest of the day. Many thanks.